is Heather Conley. I'm Senior Fellow and Director of the Europe Program here at CSIS. And on behalf of Jim Lewis, the Director of our Strategic Technologies Program, we're delighted you're here. We know you're a hearty group because it's very cold outside. So we uh, hope you have your coffee and are beginning to thaw a little bit uh, and ready for, I, I think, a very important and rich discussion about transatlantic cybersecurity. Very briefly, uh, a little over two years ago, Jim and I submitted a proposal to the EU delegation, uh, European Union delegation here in Washington, to think through uh, a, a transatlantic cybersecurity dialogue. In November of 2010, uh, a US EU summit had put forward a, a, a project, a transatlantic approach on cybersecurity and cybercrime. A year later, in 2011, a US EU working group was created to think through some of those challenges. And we thought the think tank community, that track two effort, needed to help uh, think through some challenges, some opportunities uh, in this space. So as we began our project, what, we, what became very clear is that we needed to operationalize those transatlantic values that we talk about so much. Here was an opportunity to look at norms and values and international agreements and see where cybersecurity uh, could be placed within that context. How do we think about that? And in some ways, as we went through this project and different international events and, and opportunities, we understood that those Western values in some ways were being challenged by codes of conduct by other emerging powers who wanted to have a say in how cyber was thought about and constructed. And so we began this journey uh, with a conversation in Brussels in February of last year. And as we began to plan for the conversation to take place in Washington, two words entered the cybersecurity space that no one had heard of before. Those two words were Edward Snowden. And in some ways, that provided us a very important opportunity, both a challenge and an opportunity, to look at those transatlantic values and see how they can be used here. So it's, uh, it's been a, a fantastic project. We are so grateful to the EU delegation for providing us very generously with the funding to roll up our sleeves and look at this issue. There are many people in this room that have contributed to this conversation, to our wisdom and knowledge as we approach this subject. And so we, we thank you. I could not have done this well, at all without my true partner in crime, Jim Lewis, who is really the brains behind this operation. Uh, but I also want two special uh, words of note. Yeah, that, that's a, that's a wind-up for you, Jim. Um, Francois Rivasseau, the deputy head of the EU delegation here, uh, has been uh, a colleague and, again, providing incredibly rich insights. Francois spent most of his time in the disarmament security and multilateral universe, which was absolutely perfect because that's where we wanted to think through cyber in this space. And then we have also with us Tom Dukes, who's the deputy coordinator for cyber issues at the State Department. Tom's boss, Chris Painter, has been an inst instrumental voice and thought leader in this project. He could not be with us, but Tom, we're so grateful to you and, and the assistance that you've provided us to this project. So, so as we begin, Jim's going to give you an overview of the work we've done over the last two years. Then we're going to turn to Francois for some reflections about that from the European Union perspective. And then we'll turn to Tom to give us his thoughts uh, from the State Department. And then we're going to shush, as my mother would say up here, and turn to you for some questions and answers. We have a good hour of discussion. We hope everyone will thaw out by that point uh, and, uh, and then hopefully Hopefully, uh, continue on the, this good discussion. So, with that, thank you so much for being here with us. And, Jim, over to you. Um, thank you, Heather. And let me start by saying we've had uh, two roundtables as part of this project uh, one in Brussels and one in Washington, and uh, many interviews, uh, including with some people in the room. And so, we're very grateful for their assistance. And I don't know if uh, Bob Pollard is here, but oh, there he is. Oh, and Bob, of course, has uh, contributed a one of the major sections of the report uh, discussing uh, progress within the commission itself. So that will be in the final published version. Thanks, Bob, who has provided us with his deep insights from his experience in Brussels. Um, the project's premise was that uh, 
The U.S. and Europe can provide the foundation for international cooperation in cybersecurity, that there's a shared interest transatlantically in a stable international order based on the rule of law, uh, open arrangements for trade, and a commitment to democratic uh, governance and individual rights, but that these face a challenge that maybe we didn't expect a few years ago. Um, the starting point for international cooperation is the applicability of existing international law and the norms that currently govern state relations, but these norms could be expanded, and we looked at five categories in the report, uh, norms for international security, for internet governance, uh, for political values and rights, uh, for development, which we learned is very important, and for data protection. Right? Uh, in international security, there's an understanding that the current framework of lo the laws of armed conflict applies, but that it needs to be expanded and perhaps amended. There are areas of ambiguity. We tried to think of places where um, you could do things that go beyond what we do now. So you could have perhaps international agreement to avoid attacks on targets where the risk of collateral damage and escalation is great. The thing that's different about the internet is that um, Distance is not an obstacle. So, you know, we hear there aren't borders. There are borders. Um, we hear that, uh, you know, it's a new kind of weapon. It's really not that new, but its characteristics are high speed and great range. And so in some of the interviews, we had discussions about how you could, um, I should pick a neutral country. You could shoot at New York and end up hitting uh, Pittsburgh, right? Because you, you don't know the scope of collateral damage. So agreeing that, uh, the f core infrastructure of the internet, the DNS system, nuclear power plants, um, things where the risk of collateral damage or escalation are great should be considered off bounds. Um, you could stigmatize certain kinds of weapons, right? Uh, you might want to think about that consistent with the approach that we have done uh, with WMD. So saying that some kinds of cyber attacks or some targets are not beyond the bounds of warfare might be useful. On governance, the thing that we heard repeatedly is that this was the governance structure we have now was designed um, by the West for a largely Western user base. And this has become a global infrastructure. The majority of users will increasingly be outside the West, and we need to find ways to accommodate their concerns. <laughs> they have a greater interest in um, a role for governments than perhaps the original Western model. But when we accommodate those interests, we have to do it in a way that doesn't throw overboard the many benefits we get from the current uh, multi-stakeholder model. And in particular, there's a real tension. There are some countries that would like to use the process of changing internet governance and building greater cooperation on cybersecurity to impose political constraints and to reduce access to content and to rewrite, in some ways, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. This is an important point where a uh, transatlantic effort needs to uh, push back and assert uh, a more positive outcome. Um, under international law, states are free to impose restrictions on their national networks consistent with their international commitments to human rights, right? And that's a difficult one in the first place, and it becomes more difficult when you realize that some states wish to impose extraterritorial constraints, and the vehicles for using this um, could be the ITU, it could be other things. So how do you come up with a, a new approach that protects uh, political rights while recognizing you know, the responsibilities and the, the rights that sovereigns have? And no one has articulated this in a particularly useful way. Uh, we think that would be a good area for development. Um, development itself is, is crucial, and if you looked at the World Conference on Information Technology uh, about uh, December 2012. The message that was perhaps unexpected, although it should have been, was that there's a, a, a large number of countries that support uh, a internet where governments play a greater role. There's a smaller number of countries who defend the existing multi-stakeholder model. But the majority of countries are in the middle and these are very often developing countries, non-aligned, G77. And when you ask them, what are your interests here? Their interests are economic. They are interested in development. They are interested in broadband access to improve their economies. And that is the fundamental 
question for them, more than cybersecurity, more than political control. Um, the West, the transatlantic community, can help shape the move to development by ensuring that they have the tools, these countries have the tools and the skills to make their networks more secure. One thing that came up repeatedly when you talk, say, to African countries or some Latin American countries is we deploy broadband networks, but we know they aren't secure. And the minute we connect to the global internet with high-speed networks, um, we're overwhelmed with cybercrime. How do we? How can we help them avoid that? And there are efforts underway, but this is an important, uh, important issue. As Heather mentioned, uh, there's this fellow who lives in Russia. I can't remember his name. Um, he did. He did sort of derail the project for a while. We had to take a step back and rethink. There's an existing strategy. It needs to be amended somewhat. And I'd say the biggest amendment is any discussion of international cooperation on cybersecurity has to be expanded to include data protection. In the past, when we talked about protecting data in cybersecurity, the focus was on intellectual property and protecting it from economic espionage. This is still important, and it's clearly in the economic interests of both Europe and the US to clamp down on cyber espionage. But a new transatlantic norm has to recognize the importance of personal data, right, and commitments on personal data. And perhaps um, you could build on existing principles in the countries of the transatlantic community, their domestic principles for oversight and accountability based on uh, democratic values and impress for their adoption internationally. We think that would be useful. A new approach that makes citizen data more secure, right? Um, when we talked about mechanisms for transatlantic cooperation, there has been a debate uh, well, over a global approach or a regional approach or a like-minded countries approach. Um, our conclusion was it's time to move to a like-minded countries approach, right? That the global approach will, while important, will be very slow and faces uh, political uh, obstacles. The regional approaches have been very successful in some areas. The work in the OSCE, for example, on confidence building measures has made uh, a tremendous contribution. But for the democratic political values that we think are at the core of international security, uh, approach of like-minded nations beginning with the transatlantic community um, would be the essential place to start and would set a precedent for gl later global co cooperation. We use the example of progress in certain areas, the non-proliferation, um, human rights, where this model has worked before, money laundering. Um, it's time to do this now for cyberspace. Um, transatlantic cooperation on international norms <clears throat> can institutionalize democratic values and help build a stable <laughs> environment. And what we hope this report will do is contribute to the um, thinking about the upcoming March summit uh, between the Commission and, and the United States and can contribute to the work that follows that summit. You know, summits always make a, a general statement. They're nice. Um, it's the work that follows the summit, and so we hope that this report will provide some useful discussion for the people, the diplomats, the member states on whom this burden will fall as they move forward. With that, why don't I stop and let our speakers. Thank you, Heather, and thank you to the CSIS for organizing uh, this debate and uh, working on these issues which are so important uh, to all of us. Uh, as, uh, and uh, if I may say so, bravo oh. for your report. <laughs> um, well, um, this issue uh, will be one, uh, probably, one uh, point which could be uh, discussed in the EU-US summit. We have not yet the agenda, but this is a strong candidate for being on the agenda, despite the fact that no decision has been taken yet. Um, well, uh, maybe I could just uh, update, start by updating a bit where we are in the European Union on cyber legislation. We are advancing the legislation of cybersecurity. It will be a directive. Once implemented, it will constitute the framework for our action in this domain. And there are four main objectives we want to achieve. The first one is to ensure that member states are prepared against cyber attacks. So we need 
to have them appropriately equipped. We want them to set up computer emergency response teams, a competent authority for network and information security. So we start from that, you know, build up the basis. Second is to ensure Europe-wide cooperation, cyber, what in Europe we call cyber solidarity against cyber threat and attacks. And this uh, means that we need mechanism for exchange of information on actual and potential cross-border risk. We have already informal one, but we, have, we need to have much more formalized, much more immediate, much more broadly covering, you know, the, uh, it's like uh, in every defense problem, the safety of uh, any system uh, and the strength of any system is exactly the strength of the weakest point. So we have to make sure that there's no weak points, and this is where we are at now. <coughs> And the, and the infrastructure has to be secure and allow for confidentiality of information exchanged and coordination of responses. The third objective, uh, the state, the EU, the citizens, is to ensure a culture of security across vital sectors and, vi and uh, all actors, including energy, transport, banking, healthcare, key internet enablers, public administrations, and the list is not uh, closed. Operators have to adopt risk management approaches systematically to report incidents to the national competent authorities and to be responsabilized in this field. We hope that this legislation, this directive, could be adopted before the end of 2014, otherwise it will be probably one year later. But in the meanwhile, we have already launched last June an industry platform in a similar way to the NIST process that takes place here in the US. And this is the European Network Information Security Platform which will identify good cybersecurity practice across the value chain and promote the adoption of secure solutions. Now, now uh, where are we uh, at the transatlantic level? Uh, our strategy foresees a specific place for EU-US cooperation in this regard, uh, with ambitious objective, which is to preserve an open, free, and secure cyberspace, which is a global challenge which the EU should address together with relevant international partners and at bilateral level, cooperation with the US is particularly important and will be further developed. And this remains valid, whatever the developments uh, by somebody, uh, you said uh, whose name? <laughs> uh, I think uh, it has to take with the climate, yes. We, that, uh, we see a lot of snow by these days in Washington also. Uh, <coughs> now, uh, this is a priority, and uh, this issue is high on the agenda on both sides of the Atlantic. With our cyber security strategy of last year, we have asserted values and policy guidelines, and we know that they are uh, apparently uh, largely convergent with the ones expressed in U.S. policy papers on cyber security. So it's increasing, this issue is increasingly central to our dialogue. Now, what to do with this dialogue? Hmm? That's uh, where's the beef. Uh, that's a problem, uh, and I think the approach taken by CSIS is particularly stimulating because it identifies five issues, five uh, domains, which I really think are um, uh, on the uh, part of the right kind of approach. We have to be solutions and problems focused and oriented. Uh, but we have a lot of things to do in this field because generally uh, I could tell you a number of nice uh, things on internet governance. Uh, on uh, uh, what to do, which would be, which look very much like, I guess, uh, talking under the control of Mr. Dukes, which would uh, very much look like what you uh, are used to hear from uh, the U.S. government, uh, that uh, cyberspace has become increasingly a public policy space, that we want a clear definition of the roles of public authorities and stakeholders in internal governance, and etc., etc., and that we are attached to the multi-stakeholder uh, model, and so on and so forth. Uh, now, where does the EU uh, position itself in the global political debate worldwide? We, we try to, to stick to the idea that the European approach represents a third way or a middle ground approach between those who like no change and deny the legitimate role of public authorities in the Internet and those who call for increased nationalization of the Internet at the risk of uh, fragmentation of the Internet uh, system. Uh, and that's where uh, uh, the NSA leaks uh, uh, appear and uh, have posed us, I, I would not say it has derailed, but it has obliged us to focus uh, on uh, some aspects where we were not enough focused, probably. 
Uh, and this, as you rightly pointed out, James, is probably the problem of data privacy and uh, the how to combine uh, intelligence uh, requirement uh, and uh, data privacy concerns. And this uh, is not easy, uh, and we are working on a number of approaches to that. The first one uh, is to, to see and continue pressing the U.S. authorities to, uh, to go further, uh, to take action. We have uh, heard with great interest what uh, President Obama have, has said uh, 10 days ago. We have read with great interest the reports of uh, PCA lobby and of uh, review board. Uh, we, we believe all these efforts go in the right direction. The question is, are they going to reach the, the, the point where um, uh, we, we will consider that uh, we are in safe waters? Uh, this still remains to be seen, uh, because we are at the beginning of a process, and it's the end of a process which will count mm -hmm. and define the situation. Uh, there's a number of uh, things that are on our table today uh, between the U.S. and EU. The first one is an improvement of a safe harbor scheme that would address security issues in a way that strengthens trust in transatlantic data transfers to the U.S. in the commercial sector. It is absolutely vital. We have to also to ensure uh, the happy conclusion and the quick conclusion of what we call the umbrella agreement on data protection between EU and U.S., in which in the area of law enforcement will guarantee enforceable rights for EU citizens, including judicial redress for EU citizens not residents in the US. Um, because if we don't have an equality of right and treatment, then the conclusion will be very clear. Uh, European citizens will require uh, their data to be stored out of the US. European companies will store the data out of the US. You have seen that already Microsoft has announced that they were going to do so. And uh, the transatlantic free flow of information and data uh, between both uh, sides of uh, the pound will not be ensured in the same way because different laws will apply to data uh, pending the f uh, following the fact if they are stored on the western or on the eastern side of the Atlantic. And this will be a great problem commercially because this will create a, a, a non -tariff barrier, important non-tariff barrier to, to exchange and free trade between the US and the EU, something which is one of our big priority today. But this will also uh, have other consequences, and I think the fragmentation of the Internet regimes uh, uh, will be, uh, uh, the, the risk of such fragmentation will be seriously strengthened. And we will develop different cultures, mm. Internet cultures. And at the very end of the road, uh, till now, we have the same internet culture, or more or less. Uh, but if uh, uh, this challenge is not properly addressed, this, uh, there, are, there is a risk of divergence here. That's why these efforts are important. Uh, we have advanced a number of uh, creative ideas. You know, I will give you an example. Uh, when we discussed with our US interlocutor, and I uh, want to stress that uh, this is in a very constructive atmosphere. Um, we say we need, uh, the same than in Europe, judicial uh, redress for the citizens. And they tell us, oh, it's legally absolutely impossible uh, because A, uh, uh, the intelligence agencies will never accept such a thing. B, the Constitution is not necessarily helpful in that. Uh, and C, uh, um, uh, this would endanger uh, our security possibly. And we say this can be addressed if you have a political will to address it. When we say judicial redress, we don't uh, uh, mean that uh, uh, any U.S. judge can call the director of NSA and say, oh, because uh, the son of Mr. Snowden wants to know uh, what is on uh, uh, the Internet in the NSA files on, uh, let's say, uh, uh, the author of uh, the, uh, the attack against uh, Yemeni U.S. Uh, US cruiser in Yemen, uh, the judge has to order the publication of that in the public. No. Uh, but we have, for example, uh, in Europe, uh, well, we are told that sometimes we have some uh, security uh, institutions also in Europe, and as far as I know, they, they have never been uh, having difficulties uh, with the principle of judicial redress. So why should we be so different when we share the same culture? Uh, the solution has to be to uh, organize that in the framework of two principles. The first one is the principle of indi indirect access. 
So the citizen has not a direct access to the judge, but he has access to a magistrate, which is specifically designated by the intelligence agencies to review the files and make sure that uh, the data have been properly used, collected, and uh, are properly stocked. Uh, and he may, with the agreement of the intelligence agency, if the intelligence agency agree, uh, make the data public, but only in this, con in this situation, uh, only with the agreement. And second point, uh, there is still the question of what we call uh, dif uh, secret defense, which is the classification of the data. A classified data has first to be declassified, and the declassification can only be done by the security agency itself. So these are the two barriers which protect the thing, but guarantee that uh, an independent uh, authorized eye can review a situation to avoid, uh, um, to avoid uh, undue use of uh, individual data. And you know what strikes me when I'm here in the US is that the culture of paranoia in the US is much more developed than in Europe. Because, uh, uh, and, and I wonder sometimes if this is not connected to that. Uh, if uh, the culture of paranoia is not higher here because the possibility of uh, uh, indirect access is less uh, well organized. Uh, and um, so I wonder if we would not all benefit of uh, making uh, a creative effort to address this issue. And I'm confident that this is not impossible. Uh, we are not uh, been said, no, we shall never try. We, uh, we are said we are going to review, etc. That's why I will again say we are the beginning of a process. What counts is the end of a process. We are hopeful that through these two exercises, Safe Harbor and Umbrella Agreement, we are going to get some progress done. Final thing, final comment. Um, I've been particularly interested in your report by the, uh, obviously, uh, of a security aspect, because uh, the US have set up a cyber command. Some uh, EU member states um, have done the same without saying it, uh, but because it's at a much more reduced scale. Uh, this is a, a direction, uh, and this is something which is unavoidable, a bit like, uh, uh, you know, when the nuclear energy has been discovered, people have said we should put the genius back in the bottle, and we know that this is not uh, really possible. But the same for uh, cyber uh, attack, defense, security. You cannot put the genius back in the bottle. So you have to live with it. Uh, and uh, uh, we have made a number of progress. The EU supports the work of, of the UN Working Group on that. Uh, we, we really consider that uh, we have to set up uh, more and more, uh, uh, a logic of, uh, I would say, certainly not disarmament, we are in the opposite phase, but arms control, I would say, uh, in uh, the development of, uh, of these fields. You have outlined a number of very, very important tracks, and I think this is a, a good basis for a, a further uh, elaboration on that. Uh, and personally, I tend to believe that this part of your report should really uh, nurture and stimulate more of a reflection, uh, particularly in Brussels, where we um, are traditionally a bit uh, behind you uh, in that field. I will stop there. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Your uh, remarks are very, very important. Tom, we welcome your reflections. <coughs> Thank you very much, and uh, thank you for inviting me to participate in this, this panel. I had the pleasure of uh, sitting next to Francois and being part of the roundtable that CSI has conducted here in Washington, I guess about a year and a half ago, where we talked about these issues. And I guess my first comment would be that um, in terms of looking at operational cooperation between the US, the EU, and the EU member states, I frankly see no difference today than what I would have. So the comments I made a year and a half ago about the level of cooperation, particularly on issues like cybersecurity and cybercrime, and, and especially at the operational level in terms of dealing with incident response, uh, sharing threat information, responding to uh, transnational crime challenges that we both face, um, I, I really don't see any, any dis difference between the way things are operating now and the way things that were operating back then. And to me, that, that's a valuable uh, lesson or point to, to think about, because I think it emphasizes that to the extent that we have good, strong institutions that we've already put in place that reflect our shared values and concerns about how to address um, common challenges that are not just challenges for or threats for the US and the EU, but also for the, the larger global community, 
that we've been able to uh, maintain a very strong, constructive partnership going forward. And certainly all the, the dialogues at, at whether you're talking about the summit level down to um, the much lower level discussions that take place on a daily basis here in Brussels, elsewhere, and also the discussions that the U.S. has with the various EU member states. I, I have to say that things seem very positive and strong, and, uh, and, and I don't have, I don't think from the State Department perspective, we have any great concerns about our ability to move forward together to advance our, our shared vision, our shared values in this area. I, I would like to um, go back, I think, and, and talk a little bit more broadly about the issues that Jim provided an overview of, the, the norms um, that the report suggests for further, uh, or areas of norms for further work between the U.S. and the EU, um, and, and broaden it up a little bit. And, and I think Francois has, has done a good job of, of teeing up many of the, the current issues of debate and concern, but I, I think it's important, and, and those conversations will continue in the, in the appropriate venues, both between the US, U.S. and the EU, and also the U.S. and the various member states. But I also think it's important that we not lose sight of the very, um, the, the great number of challenges that we, we currently face, that we will have to face in the coming year and years, that if the U.S. and the EU do not uh, continue to partner as we have in over the last several years in facing these common threats, which I'll go into in a little bit more detail in a minute, um, that, that we really uh, do risk uh, causing some irreparable damage, uh, not just to our relationship, but really more to the future of the Internet. When Francois, you know, articulated the idea of having a um, secure, interoperable, reliable, open Internet, I mean, that's the same vision that the United States has. It's what the President outlined in his international strategy for cyberspace that was released in May of 2011, and, and that still holds true today. J just, so just to touch on, on, on some of the specific areas of norms that, that Jim mentioned, international security, first of all. The outcome of the group of governmental experts in the UN looking at basically international security in cyberspace and the report, the consensus report that was released last summer is an extremely important issue that, um, that Jim has done a, an excellent job and CSIS has done an excellent job of capturing in the report. And, and that, that consensus that included a number of things, but very importantly, the, the consensus view that the UN Charter applies in cyberspace, that international law, particularly international humanitarian law, i.e. the law of armed conflict, apply in cyberspace, and that further work needs to be done to develop norms and confidence building measures. That's an incredibly important um, landmark agreement. But what we currently see right now is, is sort of a race to define how those concepts move forward. And we already have seen uh, China and others organizing conferences in, in settings like the ASEAN Regional Forum, where their spin on how to think about the application of international law to cyberspace is markedly different than what the, uh, the countries represented up here and, and the U.S. and the EU would, would uh, like to see happen. And, and that's just, I think, one example, but you know, we also have work going on in the OSCE to develop norms for cyberspace. It's important that we be thinking about, I'm sorry, the confidence building measures for cyberspace. It's important that we be focusing on what sort of peacetime norms and confidence building measures can be implemented. But there is a real danger, I think, if the U.S. and the EU and the various EU member states and the other countries that are definitely, I would say, like-minded in our approaches, allow certain issues to impede our forward progress on those sorts of important international security norms and confidence building measures. Because um, it, it does not, you know, take much uh, attention to the rest of the geopolitical debate in this area to realize that other countries, Russia, China, um, very much see this current situation and what appears to be, at least at some level, a rift between the U.S. and the EU as a very good opportunity to not just drive a wedge between the U.S. and the EU, which I don't think realistically would happen, but to undermine the excellent work that we've done together to really expand these norms out to the larger audience, the developing world audience, that really have to uh, embrace the, these ideas. If the G77 does not agree with us on 
um, issues from how to deal with international security in cyberspace, development, cybersecurity, uh, political rights or human rights, then um, we're not really going to uh, get to the, the type of cyberspace and internet that we all very much want and need to achieve, ultimately. So on a couple of the other norms, I think they're worth brief comment, um, just to, again, highlight some of the positive things that, that are going on that I think are, are the things we will continue to build upon. In the area of cybersecurity, the US-EU Working Group on Cybersecurity and Cybercrime um, continues to be an, a, a good venue for us to work together. We certainly can find ways to improve our cooperation on things like incident response, awareness raising, sharing information about threats, um, improving uh, cert to cert relationships through things like the International Watch and Warning Network. Those are all good ways ahead. In the area of development, um, while it's important to um, ensure that we expand access to the internet and the US and uh, the EU through the External Action Service are, are both looking to really ramp up their capacity building activities. We also have to ensure that as access is expanded, we do it in a way that builds in a culture of cybersecurity and builds in the right technical standards, laws, institutions, the right collaboration between governments and the private sector and civil society so that you don't just build infrastructure and then sort of let the rest of it sort itself out. If you don't have the right cybersecurity in place, it, and with cybersecurity in the most kind of expansive um, definition, then you're not going to reap the economic benefits, the social benefits that, that will flow from expanding access to the internet. In the area of governance, again, the, uh, the WICKET uh, process, the treaty conference um, for the ITU that took place last year in Dubai um, was a, a, a uh, you know, the, the end result was that the US, EU member states, and a number of many other developed countries walked away and did not sign the new treaties, uh, treaty uh, documents because of concerns about how they would impact issues like internet governance. As we move into the, the, uh, the events that will take place in the coming year, things like the quadrennial ITU plenipotentiary conference, where many of these same issues that were discussed at the wicket will be, for lack of a better word, relitigated, reconsidered. Um, as we look at things like the upcoming ITU uh, development conference, again, these are opportunities where if the US and the EU do not continue our strong partnership, do not continue working towards our long-term strategic goals of a, a, ensuring a good environment for the internet, then the good work we've done in the past could be undone, could be undermined in, in a way that could have very long term and, and, and wide reaching effects that, that would not be pleasant for any of us here. Um, two last things that I'll, that I'll mention that I think are, are worth uh, further thought and work between the US and the EU. In the area of political rights and human rights, um, what one of the things that we in, in my office see as, as a very positive development in the last few years is the creation and launch of the Freedom Online Coalition, which was launched um, by the Dutch government, has a, a little over 20 members right now, but has also demonstrated that you can find um, a group of like-minded countries that will come, around, come together around a key issue. And if you look at the membership of the Freedom Online Coalition, which essentially is designed for countries to express their support and promote um, you know, human rights online, freedom online. You've got core EU member states, but then you also have countries like Ghana and Kenya and countries in the Americas, countries in Asia. And it, it demonstrates, I think, a good successful example of a model for bringing together a like-minded group built around a core issue that reflects our values that's broader than just the US and the EU and sort of the, the usual suspects. And then my last comment I would make is one thing that personally, and this may reflect my, my uh, background as a cybercrime prosecutor, but one thing that when I, when I looked at the five pillars that seemed to me to be another uh, potentially very good pillar would be advancing norms on cybercrime and advancing cooperation around cybercrime. Because if you look at, for instance, the success of where we are with international cooperation in this area, particularly built around the Budapest Cybercrime Convention, which now has over 40 parties, um, and if you look at the, sort of the evolution that, that, that is, is laid out in the CSIS report of talking about you know, finding 
uh, projects, norms that reflect the shared US EU values, and then needing to bring in other countries in the developed world to also embrace that. that that's exactly what the Budapest Convention is. If, if you sort of set aside the fact that it's a treaty and think of it instead as a set of norms that say that to effectively deal with transnational crime involving electronic evidence, high-tech crime, cyber crime, however you want to think about it, that you have to have agreed common definitions of what's a crime. You have to have um, a certain set of investigative powers so that law enforcement can effectively deal with the challenge. And then you have to have strong informal and formal international cooperation mechanisms so that countries can work together to deal with what is a transnational challenge. And the, the evolution of the Budapest Cybercrime Convention in the, since it's, it's, it, since it was initially open for signatures in late 2001 is that the US, Canada, Japan, the Council of Europe member states, which largely overlap with the European Union st member states, signed on, to, signed on to the convention and worked towards ratification. But most of the ratifications that, you know, so all the ratifications that took place in say the first decade or so of the convention, the first eight, nine years were those core states. But if you look now at the dozen or so countries that are currently in the process of becoming parties, and you look at the, the most recent uh, new parties to the convention, you see that it is greatly broadened in, its, uh, in its, its membership. So in 2012, you had Australia and Japan become parties. In 2013, you had uh, the Dominican Republic and Mauritius become parties. But you also had countries like Colombia and Senegal and, and a number of others ask and, be, and receive formal invitations to become parties. And there are probably another eight or 10 countries um, that are in the process of getting um, to the point that, that they will receive formal invitations in the near future from the Council of Europe to also become parties. And all of those countries will be uh, members of the developing world. And, and so you know, right now, when you look at the countries that are, that are in the process, you see essentially every region of the world, because I, I don't think I mentioned Morocco is, is one of the countries that's in the process. So again, you can look at something like the Budapest Convention, and I think it serves as a very good model for how to build a norm that's based on our joint values and then, and then build it outwards and, and embrace, get it embraced by a large number of countries. So I'll, I'll wrap up with that and, and just, again, make the final point that at an operational level, I, I think that the, uh, the cooperation between the US and the EU and the EU member states is actually extremely good. Definitely room for improvement, um, but not because of le recent um, you know, concerns and, and, and uh, debates over how to proceed about a variety of issues, whether it's things like how to deal with data protection in the context of safe harbor, a debate that was already taking place that has taken on new dimensions with the advent of the NSA disclosures. But, but if, you, if you set aside that aspect of the discussion, which is very important and will continue, and focus on these core issues where we continue to have extremely strong shared um, values and interests and also need to very much continue our strong partnership to ensure that we don't see the good work that we've, we've achieved over the last decade or more of working together undone, set back, undermined. Um, I, I think those are things that I would like to see us focus on as, as we move ahead and continue this dialogue. Thanks. Thanks so much, Tom. Um, what I'd like to do now is turn to you with some questions. What we'll do is we'll bundle them. And I'll let our speakers, we'll have a final closeout. You can respond to the questions and give any closing thoughts to, to these uh, very thoughtful presentations. So with that, I think we have a colleague right here. We just need a microphone. Coming your way, <laughs> right here. Thank you. No, thanks, uh, Arwan Nagadek from George Washington University. Uh, a couple of questions. The first to Francois: To what extent are you uh, confident that, you know, talking about the man who has no name uh, from Moscow, that the European Union member states themselves do not need to uh, or, um, work on shared shared norms uh, and and behaviors? You know, one of the shocks to the system from the Snowden revelations was the extent to which it's not only a discussion or or, or um, uh, or 
all the paper are being removed from the cracks between between the EU and the US, but among the Europeans themse themselves. I mean, the questions being asked of the of the British in the sense that uh, some European nations' reaction to the NSA leaks was to try and, and negotiate to approximate the Five Eyes No Spy Agreement. So, to what extent are you confident that that the EU um, has its act together? Uh, and I suppose the uh, the broader question would be that you all touched upon to some extent is um, the terminological vagueness that plagues the whole cyber security debate. You know, we uh, from your comments and on the paper, yeah, there's um, a sense that we are talking about you know many issue areas where the EU and the US sure, still are working very closely together as against the whole espionage uh, data privacy issue. Um, can we, should we de-link uh, the, the several pieces of the puzzle? Um, or is that, as Francois had put it on another issue, but is cyber security, can it not be un unbundled because it will fail based on the weakest part of what we mean by cyber security? Uh, but can we de-link uh, the, the component pieces there? Thanks. I have to add one one myself. Um, Francois, you you painted uh, a very bleak picture potentially if if the some of the key issues around data protection cannot be adequately addressed. And and I think in some ways, Tom's presentation showed the strength of the US EU relationship in times of great political strain, that we, we understand the importance, we, we have to operationally maintain it. But Francois, you suggested, and this is, Jim and I have had many lively debates about this over the last several months, the politics of this become extremely fraught. And political leaders have to respond to, to that pressure, no matter if they understand the operational imperatives on the security front. They understand this. We can call each other hypocritical. We can call each other different things. But the fact of the matter is we have a big political challenge in front of us, and we have to find a way to manage that. And I think I see willingness on both sides of the Atlantic, but I'm I, I sort of a little more sympathetic, Francois. I, we have a start. It came seven months after the initial revelations, but it's the proof will be in the implementation and the pudding, as we say. So I'd welcome, and Jim, you can we can have a little debate on that, I'm sure. So uh, with that, why don't we just work down the line, Francois, you can, again, closing thoughts, respond to the questions, and uh, we'll just move down the line. Thank you, Heather, thank you, thank you. Uh, I will agree with everything that Tom has said about uh, the strength of our cooperation. Uh, this is uh, a fact. Another fact is that, uh, as you said, Heather, uh, the reaction in Europe to the um, uh, NSA leaks has been stronger uh, than, uh, than many imagine here. And uh, not everywhere, not in every country, uh, it changed. Uh, you have countries where the reaction has been minimal. Uh, you have countries who were not interested. But you have countries where the reaction has been really uh, maximal, I would say. Uh, so we are not a uh, completely homogeneous and unified space in Europe, you know. Uh, and that's why also um, uh, we, uh, the Council has taken the wise decision to, uh, to define a sort of two-track approach. Uh, the question related directly to uh, intelligence uh, <coughs> are questions which are uh, in the EU system, first and foremost, of the uh, competence of member states, and so the dialogue with the US on these issues has to be conducted through member states. That's why I want, uh, I'm not the best place to answer to your uh, question about uh, five eyes of a uh, discussion between the UK and uh, other member states, uh, because uh, this is something which, um, and the dialogue with the US on these issues, which, this is something which takes place on a national basis, and we think it's better like that. Uh, because uh, if I am sure of something, is that uh, our cooperation uh, against cybercrime and uh, uh, cybersecurity uh, w will remain very strong, whatever. Uh, I don't think that the danger are f mostly there. Uh, I think the risk, as I, as I said, is more 
in uh, the reaction of the public on one hand, and it impacts it can have on the business and the reactions of the business uh, to adapt uh, itself to the wishes of the public on one hand. And on the second hand, uh, which could lead, as I said, to a sort of divergence in the cultures on the two sides of the Atlantic. And the second uh, kind of risk would be a political uh, outcry on certain quarters of Europe. Uh, you know that we shall have like EU elections this year, uh, end of May for the EU Parliament. Uh, uh, so a sort of uh, move which would uh, push uh, parliamentaries to uh, request some uh, measures of uh, temporary protection being made, such as suspending uh, the safe harbor. You know that we have had some uh, a number of uh, EU parliamentaries who have advocate who are who are still advocating that, and. Uh, and, and some in, in indirect impact also on the whole uh, trade, um, our whole trade approach. You know, a, a point which is uh, uh, important to know is that we see now in a country, uh, uh, in a big central country in Europe, I would say, I will not name it either, in a very big, uh, in one of the biggest, if not the biggest one country in Europe, <laughs> uh, uh, a movement of public opinion which uh, is based on this NSA re revelation and uh, which asks for a uh, uh, suspension of a negotiation with the EU. Uh, this is the kind of challenge we have to address. It's a political challenge that we have to address both together. But, we have, uh, but if we want to address it, we have to, 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 to realize the exact size, not to uh, overkill, not to overreact, but not to underreact also. We have to react properly and to address properly what the citizens think and believe. Uh, and uh, that's our challenge, and that's... Um, uh, uh, that's why we have uh, welcomed, as I said, uh, the speech of President Obama uh, of uh, this month. But uh, as I said also, it's the beginning of a process. Uh, and uh, particularly if you note that this speech was mostly focused on uh, uh, an answer to the concerns expressed here domestically. And if you note, for example, that uh, an important body like the PCLOB has uh, divided his report in two, one dealing with internal aspects and the other dealing mostly with external aspects. So, you know, we, we are still at the beginning of a process of answering the concerns uh, expressed in Europe. That's why uh, we have to continue with the effort. Thank you, Francois Tom. Great. Thank you very much. And just briefly, I, I, I agree with Francois very much that, you know, we're, I don't know necessarily at the beginning of the process, but I would say that we have a very good process and we have a very good, you know, basis for having very frank and I think constructive discussions between the US and the EU on a broad range of issues. I, I remember in I think it was 2004 when I first heard about Safe Harbor and, and the issue of data privacy. Um, and you know, at the time it struck me as a very uh, contentious, difficult, intractable problem. How were we going to somehow bridge the differences between the US's approach to uh, privacy and data issues and the, the EU's approach? And, you know, I have to say a decade later, you know, it, it seems like we've, we've always managed to, to find a way to move forward, to, to work through these issues. And I'm confident that we will continue uh, to do that um, because, again, we have very strong shared values and commitments to the same um, way ahead, whether it be on the trade front or on the security front or on any of the issues that we're talking about. I, I know that uh, this weekend um, the Munich Security Conference will start off uh, for the U.S. side, we'll have uh, my big boss, the Secretary of State, also the Secretary of Defense will be there. And I know um, uh, a number of, of very high-level leaders from across the EU and the rest of the world. I I'm sure that it would be fa fascinating to be able to uh, be a fly on the wall uh, listening to some of their private discussions. I I'm sure that, that this will come up, but, you know, as, uh, as in some of the, the recent high-level meetings we've had with officials from the EU, NATO, you name it, you know, at the end of the discussions we always say, but we also have to remember there are many other great challenges facing us right now. For instance, Syria, Middle East <laughs> peace, um, you name it. There, there are a whole host of security and other challenges. And, and this is one issue, um, but I think if you look back historically, you're always going to be able to identify uh, times in history, times in our history between the U.S. and the EU, where we've had uh, issues political or otherwise that have caused us to have momentary disagreements. And 
I am thankfully not a politician. I've been a career, uh, you know, civil servant focused on uh, law enforcement and security issues and now diplomacy. And, um, but I have great confidence in the political leaders of the United States and the European Union and the EU member states to find a way to work through any um, current or future disagreements or areas of tension that we have and to continue to make good forward progress on our shared goals and values, particularly in this area of making sure that <clears throat> we end up with, ha with a cyberspace that really is open, interoperable, secure, and reliable, because anything else is, is going to be uh, a, a really bad outcome for, for all of us and for the rest of, of the global community. Thank you. Thanks, Jim. Last words. Oh, uh, how lucky. Um, <laughs> I won't. Uh, what I'll do, I will answer the question about can the issues be delinked, and I think the trend is actually the other way, which is in the last year, uh, we've seen a convergence of issues, and so it's difficult now to have a discussion of governance without touching on cybersecurity, without touching on political rights, uh, without touching on um, conflict, right? And so the whether that's in part driven by some of the other countries who have a more unified agenda or whether the difference was uh, artificial uh, when we started thinking about internet issues almost 20 years ago it doesn't matter well, it does matter but it it's it, convergence is the trend and so you can't uh, you can't really delink these things of course you have to deal with them in different fora but you have to realize the issues are um, associated in a way that you can't do something in one area without affecting the others. Uh, you know, I think the message that uh, we've heard is um, the strong uh, shared values. The one part that perhaps we haven't uh, emphasized enough is that uh, these shared values are facing uh, a much greater challenge than we might have expected uh, a decade ago. And there is a dispute in FAMIL. We've been caught doing something uh, that has generated a, a legitimate response, but I would hope that these uh, disputes don't disrupt the, the larger strategic interests of both sides. Um, there is a solution to these things, I think. Uh, it will take time to work through them. We've certainly seen similar debates in the past between European countries and the U.S. over strategy and, and security related issues. And the process that's begun will hopefully lead us to rebuild, re-strengthen, uh, expand the relationship because I think the alternatives are, will all be unwelcome. Right? So if the report can help contribute to that, uh, that would be a good outcome. Thank you. Yeah, I very much agree and I'm pretty sure to join, and I joined Tom in expressing the confidence that uh, this is precisely because we all believe that, that uh, we are going to a summit, that uh, we want to illustrate the convergence of all these aspects and uh, to, to remind uh, to everybody here on the two sides of the Atlantic that uh, our cooperation is much more important than uh, in so many fields that your report has, has touched. And I'm pretty sure that the summit will offer us an opportunity to, uh, to, to restate that. Um, uh, and uh, once again, uh, thank you for reminding us these basic truths. Well, in a very brief thank you again to the EU delegation in Washington for supporting our, our thinking on this subject and for your intellectual contribution. Thank you, Francois, as always. Thank you, Tom, for your insights. Uh, Jim, it's been terrific two years working with you. I'd like to thank my colleagues, James Mina uh, and Claire Fritz, for assisting us so ably uh, throughout this, uh, this journey. Uh, we look forward to more conversations about this. And uh, uh, again, on behalf of CSIS, thank you for joining us on this very cold morning. Have a great day.